I'd like us for a moment to imagine what a map would look like of those who are sent to having an unconscious. It would perhaps show conglomerations around the great metropoles. In the US, concentration on the eastern and western seaboards and a few dots here and there in between. By contrast, the map of people who are sent to having consciousness or believing themselves to be conscious would be sort of far more widespread because consciousness, for better or ill, forms part and parcel of most contemporary ontologies with the notable exception of behaviorists, diehard Heideggerians, and monists. From a historiographical perspective, there's a striking uh, asymmetry between the amount of, considerable amount of work that's been done over the last literally half a century on the history and evolution and concepts and, of the un unconscious and attendant practices with a relative dearth of work done on the history of concepts of consciousness. And I, for one, confess to being guilty for having contributed for this lopsidedness. Not much of an excuse, because I've been guilty for several decades, but better late than never to start some correction. This issue has consequences not only for the history of consciousness, however one might envisage this, but also for histories of the unconscious through resituating these within wider frameworks and also, in what concerns us here, histories of esotericism in terms of the intersection between concepts and histories of consciousness and esotericism. Now, what's striking is the term consciousness is widely taken up and performs critical, contradictory work in a number of, an array of disciplines. Just to name some at random, uh, one speaks of Marxist class consciousness, consciousness raising of political groups, the altered states of consciousness and mind expanding drugs of transpersonal psychology, the unconscious that should be made conscious of the Freudians, the jazz consciousness I found in the title of a book, and last but not least, the consciousness that should be ultimately reduced to the brain of the neurodisciplines. Now in considering the consequences of understanding Western es esotericism in terms of alterations and modifications of consciousness, I think it might be valuable as a, as a preliminary footnote to look at the history of the term consciousness and how it has been deployed. So I begin with just sketching out just some brief uh, vignettes of historical, philosophical and psychological development. In English, the term consciousness stems from the 17th century based on the Latin con scio, to know with, and designated a shared form of knowledge of some form. This in turn went back to the older word conscience, for it, it was first introduced as a synonym. So con scio, consciousness first comes as a synonym for conscience. So there's a moral and religious background which plays a critical part in our story. So it designates a form of shared knowledge. We find this uh, original usage in Hobbes' Leviathan of 1651, and I quote, when two or more men know of one and the same fact, they are said to be conscious of it one to another, which is as much as to know it together. Afterwards, men made use of the same word metaphorically for the knowledge of their own secret facts and secret thoughts. And therefore, it is rhetorically said that conscious conscience is a thousand witnesses. So even the notion of secrecy, one sees, has certain, of course, etymological linkages with our theme today, esotericism. In Latin and French, the term uh, conscienta or conscience could mean both what we understand as moral conscience and consciousness, and continues in this way in French today. A shift away from this, of course, starts with uh, Descartes, and in England with the Cambridge Platonists. In the Meditations, Descartes uses the Latin word conscio, and I quote, 
thought, I use this term to include everything that is within us in such a way that we are immediately aware, conski, of it. Thus all the operations of the will, the intellect, and the imagination, and the senses are thoughts. As far as I can recall, he uses it as a verb and not specifically as a noun. The operative term is the object, thought. The first to use the word consciousness is Ralph Cudworth, the Reverend Ralph Cudworth, Cambridge Platonist, in his 1678, The True Intellectual System of the Universe. We asked, has anyone here read The True Intellectual System of the Universe? One, two, three. Three. Brilliant. That's more than I. <laughs> I confess that's more than myself. I've read must, a lot of it, but not all of it. So, this work, uh, he takes aims at materialism, hylozoism, atheism, and paganism, and virtually what anyone prior to Cudworth had thought about the universe to erect the first true system. It's a 700 page book of a projected three volume work and the other two volumes never saw the light of day. So consciousness for uh, Cudworth is in a certain sense a transposition or translation of the synesthesis of Plotinus. And in the true intellectual system of the universe, Cudworth refers to what he calls the plastic power of nature, a subordinate instrument of divine providence. As he puts it, the plastic nature in the formation of plants and animals seems to have no consense or consciousness of what it does. This was a simple vital energy. Consequently, clear and expressed consciousness was not vital for life. So contrary to Descartes, he claimed, our human souls are not always conscious of what, whatever they have in them. An example of this was the following. There is also another more interior kind of plastic power in the soul, whereby it is formative of its own cogitations, which is not always conscious of, as when in sleep or dreams it frames interlocutory discourses betwixt itself and other persons, with coherent sense and apt connections, in which oftentimes it seems to be surprised with unexpected answers and repartees, though itself for all the while the potent inventor of the whole fable. Not unconscious, but to use Cudworth's word, inconscious, a term that hasn't been taken up, but who knows, it still could, could catch on. Cudworth's term consciousness was taken up, shorn from its Neoplatonic and theological underpinnings. A move away then from shared knowledge to a notion of consciousness as what is privately introspectable, Hobbes's knowledge of secret facts. A key figure that took up the study of Cudworth was, of course, John Locke. In his essay of, in his work, Essay Concerning Human Understanding of 1619, Locke noted, every man being conscious to himself that he thinks. And he continues, Thinking consists in being conscious that one thinks. If they say that a man is always conscious to himself of thinking, I ask how they know it. Consciousness is the perception of what passes in a man's own mind. The mind was peopled with ideas, and Locke had a wide definition of what constituted ideas. Quote, Before moving on, I must here at the outset ask you to excuse, frequently you'll find me to use the word idea in this book. It seems to be the best word to stand for whatever is the object of the understanding when a man thinks. I've used it to express whatever is meant by phantasm, notion, species, or whatever it is that the mind can be employed about in thinking. So we find here a curious circularity and bifurcation in Locke's language. For instance, he notes, everyone is conscious to himself that he thinks, and when thinking is going on, the mind is engaged with the idea that it contains. Idea, mind, thought, consciousness. Four words to simultaneously describe one act of something going on. And we'll find this bifurcation and circularity in later 
definitions and conceptions of consciousness. In his dictionary, Samuel Johnson gave two meanings to the word consciousness. The perception of what passes in one's mind and the internal sense of guilt or innocence. The Germans took longer to become conscious. The cognate term Bewusstsein originates in the 18th century with Christian Wolf, 1719. And one notes already in his dreams of a spirit seer of 1776, Kant deployed the term Bewusstsein as a critique of the noetic claims of Swedenborg. Commenting on insanity in trance states, Kant notes, the confused individual places mere objects of his imagination outside of himself and considers them to be real and present objects. The lines indicating the direction of the movement and accompanying the fantasies in the brain as their material auxiliaries must meet inside the brain and that consequently the location of the picture in the subject's consciousness in the waking state must be placed inside of himself. In the inside of himself not in heaven, hell, or Mars, or wherever Swedenborg thought he was venturing out of himself. So we find consciousness deployed as a form of critique of the passage to other states, possibilities of, indeed, of any noetic claim being placed upon particular states. This privative, as opposed to communal sense of consciousness, is captured by Thomas Reed in his essay concerning intellectual powers of 1785. Reed notes, consciousness is a word used by philosophers to signify that immediate knowledge which we have of our present thoughts and purposes, and in general, of all the present operations in our minds. So the question that it seems important to pose is, what work is the term consciousness doing? What is it displacing, de displacing? So from some of these examples, it's clear that it's displacing hylozoism, panpsychism, paganism, and significantly noetic claims based on varieties of experience, of unusual experiences. In short, a philosophy of subjectivity detached from body and world, leading to endless attempts to solve the problem thus created subject, object, inner, outer, mind, body. The main lines of Western philosophy and psychology remain within the terms thus cast, which is not to say that there weren't noticeable exceptions. Within the space demarcated by the concept of consciousness, further subdivisions and stratifications ensued. In 19th century German thought, consciousness waned while the unconscious waxed but both remained within a philosophy of representations. Important to recall then that this trajectory was the result of anterior philosophical problematics. At an epistemic level, one considered the coming of consciousness to the more decisive event, as it established a framework within second order internal differentiations of the unconscious, subconscious, subliminal consciousness, co-consciousness, alternate consciousness, and its cognates followed. Now, within this context, there were attempts to supplement or expand this reduced interior subjective state of consciousness. One interesting example was that of Edward Carpenter, the English writer and socialist. In the late 1880s, he developed a model of the development of consciousness which passed from simple consciousness, self-consciousness, to cosmic consciousness. In his book of 1892, from Adam's Peak to Elephanta, sketches in Ceylon in India. He narrated how in Ceylon he was fortunate enough to make the acquaintance of one of the esoteric teachers of the ancient, ancient religious mysteries. The figure was Guru Ramaswamy, whom Carpenter named the Nani. As Carpenter put it, what the Nani seeks and obtains is a new order of consciousness to which, for want of a better word, we gave the name universal or cosmic consciousness. In contradistinction, the individual, specifically bodily consciousness, with which we are all familiar. I'm not aware that the exact expression of the ex exact equivalent of the expression universal consciousness 
is used in Hindu philosophy, but the Satchit Ananda Brahm, to which every yogi aspires, indicates the same idea. Sat, the reality, the all-pervading, Chit, the knowing, perceiving, Ananda, the blissful, all these united in one manifestation of Brahm. So as Carpenter saw it, aesthetic disciplines had the aim of removing thought and opening individuals to cosmic consciousness. So we see here the sort of coupling of a notion, attempt to develop a Western notion of cosmic consciousness as a translation of Eastern, specifically Indian yogic ascetic practices. In the Western form, Carpenter maintained that the cultivation of such consciousness could usher in a new era of socialism. I guess we're still waiting for this. So this is one example of how the development of diminished interior subjective notions of consciousness led to attempts to supplement them through expanded notions. Carpenter's uh, notion of cosmic consciousness was taken up by his friend Richard M. Buck and popularized Canadian psychiatrist. Buck considered cosmic consciousness to be an evolutionary development which would eventually lead to a social utopia in which all religions would fuse and dominate every minute detail of every day of all life and all individuals would know themselves to be immortal. In fact, the whole world would be a member of Eswe. <laughs> Buck uh, maintained that the state of cosmic consciousness appeared in individuals mostly of the male sex who are otherwise highly developed, men of good intellect, of high moral qualities, of superior physique, it appears at about the time of life when the organism is at its high watermark of efficiency at the age of 30 to 40 years. So it seems Buck seems to be a prime candidate for the Me Too movement. But, uh, <laughs> this could actually increase interest in cosmic consciousness by, by accident. Uh, Buck found 50 instances of cosmic consciousness through history and he felt that it was increasing slowly in momentum, ranging from the Buddha to Dante, and most prominently to Walt Whitman, of whom was Buck, one of Buck's patients. In the 20th century, the philosophical term and conception taken up in psychologies of the 19th century were framed as sciences of consciousness. New technologies were brought to bear, new instrumental setups and sites for experimentation. Already by 1880, <laughs> Alexander Bain described consciousness as the leading term of mental science, noting 13 distinct meanings of the term. I might say only 13 distinct meanings of the term. Psychologist James Ward noted, consciousness is the vaguest, most protean, and most treacherous of psychological terms. In fact, that could have been also a good quote for the title. Uh, I turn now to William James. Buck's work attracted the attention of William James. In his chapter on mysticism and the varieties of religious experience, James argued that experience had shown that, quote, our normal waking consciousness, rational consciousness as we call it, is but one special type of consciousness, whilst all about it, parted from it by the filmiest of screens, there lie potential forms of consciousness entirely different. One of these is what he termed the mystical state of consciousness. James argued that personal religious experience had its roots in mystical states of consciousness. And he considered that these traits, these mystical states of consciousness, had four principal traits. Ineffability, a noetic quality, transience, and passivity. Again, in a way, reclaiming uh, a pre-modern notion of the mind. As James saw it, religious traditions had methodologically cultivated such states. And we see here then again this coupling that developments of cosmic consciousness were set up against this privative Lockean concept. A progressive limitation of quotidian consciousness was one of the drivers that led to expanded notions of consciousness. But critically, a few years later, James radically shifted his view of consciousness. His essay of 1904, Does Consciousness Exist? As he commences, 
Consciousness, it is the name of a non-entity and has no right to place among first principles. Those who still cling to it are clinging to a mere echo, the faint rumor left behind by the disappearing soul upon the air of philosophy. To justify a statement, sorry, he argued, to deny plumply that consciousness exists seems so absurd on the face of it, for undeniably thoughts do exist. But I fear some readers will follow me no farther. Let me then immediately explain that I mean only to deny the word, the word stands for an entity, but to insist more, most emphatically that it stands for a function. There is, I mean, no aboriginal stuff or quality of being contrasted with that of which material objects are made, out of which our thoughts of them are made. But there is a function in experience which thoughts perform and for the performance of which this quality of being is invoked. That function is knowing. Consciousness is supposed to be, is supposed necessary to explain the fact that things not only are, but are reported and are known. Whoever blots out the notion of consciousness from a list of first principles must still provide in some way for this function being carried on. So place of consciousness, and again, a place of a mind-body differentiation, James was proposing his own solution in the form of a radical empiricism of pure experience. Arguing that there is, in fact, no inner bifurcation of experience, no Lockean, Cartesian inner world that mirrors the outer, no world of consciousness. James's argument suggests that we should simply abandon talk of consciousness as it is ultimately a soul concept, or indeed, the ghostly philosophical remnants of the soul, i.e. ultimately a theological concept. It is not a first principle, it's not entitative. As Alfred North, North Whitehead might have put it, it would be an example of misplaced concreteness. Within psychology at this time, one found uh, a decline of consciousness, not from a metaphysical ground, but from an experimental ground, the decline of introspection as an investigative tool and the rise of behaviorism. In 1913, J.B. Watson noted, the time seems to have come when psychology must discard all references to consciousness. This suggested elimination of states of consciousness as proper subjects of investigation in themselves remove this barrier from psychology which exists between it and the other sciences. Consciousness within psychology was, in a way, preserved through relative displacement and relegation in the psychologies of the unconscious, where it was reduced largely to the role of a supporting actor or foil. Uh, it's odd to speak of a linkage between J.B. Watson and Martin Heidegger, but there actually is one namely through the abandonment of consciousness. In uh, Being in Time, Heidegger abandons consciousness and more specifically the Husserlian understanding of consciousness in terms of intentionality. Heidegger was critical of the reification of consciousness and in particular the concept of representations. As he notes, the perceiving of what is known is not a process of returning with one's bounced booty to the cabinet of consciousness after one has gone out and grasped it. So in place of consciousness in being in time, Heidegger was proposing an analysis of being in the world as a place that one already was in the world, in terms of the, what he called the ecstasis of Dasein. God forbid, I could imagine one could undertake a Heideggerian analysis of mystical ecstasy in terms of the ecstasis of Dasein. And, Someone's going to tell me someone has maybe already done this. Now, in the mid-20th century, one sees certain revivals of the study of consciousness. It's reemergence through cognitivism, field ultimately of consciousness studies, and finally through the neurosciences. Consciousness now being hitched to the brain as the object to be reduced, the hinge between experience and the neurosciences. One of the vectors which I'd like to consider for the revival of interest in consciousness came from an unexpected quarter. In 1954, Aldous Huxley published The Doors of Perception, detailing his 
experiences with mescaline. Significantly, he characterized these experiences in terms of profound changes in consciousness. As Huxley put it, I might so change my ordinary mode of consciousness as to be able to know from the inside what the visionary, the medium, even the mystic was talking about. Substances, for Huxley, were modifiers of consciousness. And Huxley drew a sharp distinction between states induced by substances and quotidian consciousness. As he put it, our normal word conditioned consciousness creates a universe of sharp distinctions, black and white, this and that, me and you and it. And the mystical consciousness of being at one with the infinite oneness, there is a reconciliation of opposites, a perception of the not particular in particulars, a transcending of our ingrained subject-object relationships with things and persons. There is an immediate experience of our solidarity with all being and a kind of organic conviction and in spite of the inscrutabilities of fate, in spite of our own dark stupidities and deliberate malevolence, yes, in spite of all that is so manifestly wrong, with the world, it is yet in some profound, paradoxical, and entirely inexpressible way all right. Thus, we see here for Huxley, transforming consciousness through psychoactive substances is one in the way of coming back to the perennial philosophy. This is not merely a psychological or philosophical concept, it's a whole metaphysic. It is a whole soteriology, proposing the salvation of the West. Uh, in Heaven and Hell, Huxley speculated on some of the reasons for the decline of such states since the Middle Ages. Amongst these, he noted the decline of fasting, flagellation, and changes to the chemical environment due to diet. As he put it, for almost half of every year, our ancestors ate no fruit, no green vegetables, and since it was impossible for them to feed more than a few oxen, cows, swine, and poultry during the winter months, very little butter or fresh meat, and very few eggs. So sensory deprivation for Huxley was conducive to visionary experiences. Portent, perhaps, of Brexit Britain. <laughs> visionary experiences searching for fresh salad in Tesco's. I mean, who knows? I mean, it's as likely as any outcome at this point. In a similar vein, in the 1964 book, The Psychedelic Experience. Leary Metzner and Richard Allport, Akka Ramdas, frame such experiences in terms of modifications of consciousness, describing psychedelic experiences as journeys to new realms of consciousness. Even the, the language uh, alluded to by uh, the introducer, new realms of consciousness, the figuration is critical here. They noted, such experiences of enlarged consciousness can occur in a variety of ways. Sensory deprivation, yoga exercises, disciplined meditation, religious or aesthetic ecstasies, or spontaneously. More recently, they've become available to anyone through the ingestion of psychedelic substances, such as LSD, psilocybin, mescaline, DMT, ETC. I've been interested in what the ETC uh, <laughs> referred to. Such substances were considered of consciousness expanding. And they noted, Eastern psychology, by contrast, offers us a long history of detailed observation and systematization of the range of human consciousness, along with an enormous literature of practical methods for controlling and changing consciousness. These formulations were gathered together in 1966 by the psychologist Arnold Ludwig in an essay on altered states of consciousness. And he defined them as follows. Any induced mental state, quote, which can be recognized by the, sub by the subjectively by the individual himself or by an objective observer of the individual as representing a sufficient deviation in subjective experience or psychological functioning from certain general norms for that individual during alert and waking consciousness. So one may note that viewing unusual experiences as altered states of consciousness is already an interpretation 
of such experiences within a particular philosophy and psychology of, of consciousness. And it's limbed against a notion of general norms of alert waking consciousness. What these are is left unspecified. They're black boxed as the foil, assuming that we already know what general waking consciousness and its norms consist in. The same year, Walter Panke and William Richards published an article on implications of LSD and experimental mysticism. They studied the psychedelic experience in control settings as a form of the experimental production of mystical consciousness, referring prominently to William James, noting, the experience of mystical consciousness may enable Western scholars better to understand the so-called elusive Eastern mind. In the approaching era of unprecedented cultural interaction, this possibility could be of profound significance. Not only the religious systems of Hinduism, Buddhism, and Taoism, but also Eastern political traditions and even Eastern forms of architecture may be seen to have largely originated, originated in various forms of altered consciousness. So it's a slightly quaint situation that Easterners are, are basically tripping the whole time. <laughs> but the notion is there. The notion of altered states, mystical states of consciousness, is quite clearly explicitly articulated as an avenue into Eastern esotericism. Charles Tart's 1969 anthology, Altered States of Consciousness, did much to popularize the notion of altered states of consciousness, or ASCs, as they came to be referred to. Here are a couple of Google engrams, uh, this big peak at 1960, of altered states of consciousness and altered state of consciousness. Tart defines them as follows. An altered state of consciousness for a given individual is one which he clearly feels a qualitative shift in his pattern of mental functioning. Mental functions operate that do not operate at all ordinarily. The altered state of consciousness is clearly a diacritical term, but what is the state that it's an alteration of? These states are then, as I was indicating, black boxed, as readily understood. The notion of altered states of consciousness are then mobilized as a form of social and political and cultural critique. There's not only a cosmology embedded in them, not only a metaphysic, but also a politics of social critique. The emphasis being clearly on the positive effects of such altered states of consciousness. Strikingly, within this inherently dualistic framework, no mention is made of ASBs, alternate states of the body, nor needed the relation of ASCs to ASBs, which could be termed the alternate mind and the alternate body problem. Perhaps the relation of esotericism to ASBs could be the subject of the next Esway conference if you're looking around for a theme. But it highlights the dualism inherent within this whole conceptualization. In the 1990 preface, Tart commented on the interaction between the increasing courting of ASCs in society and their study. Quote, a phenomenal increase of ASCs in our culture produced a great need for scientific knowledge as a basis for rational cultural response to increasing ASCs. The study of ASCs became one and the same with their active promotion, ultimately aimed at social and cultural transformation. William James, with uh, 20 citations, is the most cited author in Tart's anthology. But critically, the references are mainly to the James of the varieties with no mention of his critique of the very notion of consciousness in radical empiricism. Now, to conclude, what happens in the context of the study of esotericism when unusual experiences are framed and formulated in terms of ASCs, or modifications of consciousness? It seems to me we're faced here with uh, two modalities, two contexts. First, it mobilizes the notion of alternate states of consciousness for the understanding of material prior to the 17th century or from other cultures is simply poor history or poor ethnography. It's, it's anachronistic. It's quite simply the problem of viewing non-dualist material, for example, 
Kundalini Yoga to medieval Western alchemy in a dualistic framework. Material is, is hard enough to grasp within its own ontologies, let alone superimposing a foreign ontology and then trying to enact a translation from one ontology on top of another, so further complicated by one ontology in a way genealogically arises from the other. With the latter material in the West, say particularly from 1960s onwards, the, the issue becomes more complex as consciousness now features as an actor category. But most people believe themselves to be conscious. More people, I would say, believe themselves to have consciousness than believe themselves to have a soul. And in Jane's sense, it has, in, large, in a certain sense, replaced the soul as an indubitable, indubitable given of contemporary ontologies. All the more reason, then, to refrain from using notions of consciousness as an analytic category. Indeed, it would be more interesting to study what may be termed configurations of consciousness, configurations as involving metaphysics, means for the production, utilization, language games of consciousness, to look at how the utilization of conceptions of altered states of consciousness have come to frame and remodel unusual experiences within a dualistic framework. From the 1960s onwards, in particular, altered states of consciousness became an optional ontology. Individuals sought to cultivate altered states of consciousness, whether through psychedelics or esoteric practices, and framed and interpreted the results of such ensuing experiences as having experienced altered states of consciousness. This is worthy by itself of an ethnography of a historical study of documents, a variety is not of religious experience necessarily, but varieties of what have come to be framed as altered states of consciousness. So I'd then like to conclude with some salutary comments by a noted explorer of such realms. Pour finir avec le jugement de Dieu, et qu'est-ce que c'est au juste que la conscience? Au juste, nous ne savons pas. C'est le néant, un néant dont nous nous servons pour indiquer que nous ne savons pas quelque chose, de quel côté nous ne le savons, et nous disons alors conscience du côté de la conscience. Mais il y a cent mille autres côtés. From to have done with the judgment of God. And precisely what is consciousness? That is precisely what we do not know. It is nothingness, a nothingness that we use to indicate when we do not know something, from what side we do not know it. And so we say consciousness from the side of consciousness, but there are 100,000 other sides. Thank you.